One of the things that I hear from many people is that they don't know much about wine or how to describe the tastes and flavors. But you know what? That's something anybody can learn. All you need is a little practice and the right technique. I'm Tim Vandergrift, your technical winemaking advisor, and today I'm going to talk about how to taste wine. Most winemakers will agree with me that drinking your wine is the best part of the hobby. But just drinking wine is a little different from tasting wine. In tasting wine, we want to use all of our senses to evaluate what we've made, to make judgments about it. And there's a few techniques that you can use, and I'm going to show you them right now. Tasting breaks down into three separate steps. Look, smell, and taste. The first part of tasting, look, is done to assess a wine's color, its clarity, and its hue. Now just a word on clarity. Almost all wine you're ever going to be exposed to is perfectly clear. Modern fining agents will pull everything out of suspension and if the wine's been filtered it'll be brilliantly polished. There are a couple of exceptions. If you are drinking very old wine, more than five, six, or seven years old, it could throw a small deposit in the bottle over time, which when you're pouring might come out. That's not to be worried about. A little haze in that case doesn't detract from the wine. The other exception is vintage port. If you're drinking a commercial vintage port, they will often develop a crust in the bottle, which is spectacularly interesting looking, but again, doesn't affect the wine's character. So we don't need to worry too much about clarity. But color is interesting. In red wines, the color ranges from a light cherry red all the way down to an inky purpley black. Many people associate a darker color with a richer or heavier wine. That's not necessarily true. There are some French Burgundies that are merely a deep ruby color that are powerful and intense and dense wines. And then again, there are some Rhone wines with Grenache and Syrah in them that are simply happy, easy drinking, even though they are dark and black. But as a general rule of thumb that you can use, the darker a red wine usually the more intense the fruit character will be. Now there's another thing about red wines. When they're very young, they tend to be a purpley red color. When they get older, they turn to a true red and as they age further, can even take on a brick red hue. That isn't a flaw, the wine isn't going bad. What's happening is, when wines are young, they have two kinds of pigments in them. One of them is a red pigment and the other one is blue. Red and blue together, if we remember finger painting, make purple. As the wine ages, the blue pigment breaks down first, and the wine loses that purpley hue and goes to the true red. So if you look at a wine and it's very, very purple, chances are it's quite young. If it's red verging on a little bit of a bricky color, then it's well aged. The only time you have to worry about that is if the wine itself has gone brown or if it has a definite oxidized smell, which would be like cardboard or nuts or sherry. But quick look at the wine, we can tell its age by its color. Now this particular wine is a Merlot and it's got a lovely color, hints of purple at the edges, it's perfectly clear. But how do we tell that? Well, we look at it. When we look at it, most people will do something like this. This is wrong. If I look at the wine this way, I can tell I'm not going to like it because it has a cameraman in it. We want to look at it another way. The best way to assess wine is over a surface that gives us a neutral background. In this case, I'm going to use a piece of paper. So if I hold the wine up, over a piece of paper and tilt my glass, I can look down through it. And why tilting it is important is when I hold it up, I've got a thick layer of wine I'm looking at. When I tilt it on its side, I can look at the edge and get a thinner layer. That gives me a chance to see all the way through the wine and get a much more accurate assessment of color, clarity, and hue. So we'll turn this over. The wine is beautifully clear. It's purpley purple and it really looks pretty good. That covers red wines. White wines range in color from a clear, almost watery white through golden to straw 
and even a deep, rich amber color. Lighter wines would be things like Pinot Grigio or Pinot Gris, uh, heavier, more straw-colored wines, Sauvignon Blanc, to a golden color of, say, Chardonnay, or perhaps barrel-aged Chardonnay, and a deep, ambery, golden color for things like ice wine. Now, as a rule of thumb, the lighter the color of a wine, the lighter the flavor and aroma will be. Not always true, but it's a useful observation. In terms of hue, white wines can pick up some darker colors and some brown tints as they age. This usually isn't a problem unless the wine itself is oxidized. The next step is to smell the wine. In smelling the wine, we're detecting tens of thousands of different aromatic compounds. We have to use some techniques to chase those out of the glass and into our nose. The first technique that we want to use is the swirl. If we just let the wine lie flat in the glass, those low weight molecular compounds, the aromas, won't be free. We want to swirl the wine in the glass, shaking them up and causing them to leap into the air where we can smell them. Now, I'm a trained professional. I can swirl free handed without spattering my cameraman. But if you have trouble with that, getting a good swirl going, there's a little trick you can use. If you put your glass down onto a flat surface or a tabletop and simply move the base back and forth in a tiny oval, just like this, it'll swirl and stay level without leaving the glass. And then you can use it. Okay? The next step when we've got our swirl going is to sniff the wine. Now, I don't want anyone to bunny sniff. That's not enough. When you sniff wine, you have to sniff hard and very deeply. The reason for this has to do with some complicated physiology. Human beings have their nasal bulb in the back of their sinus passages. And the nasal bulb is a very interesting organ. It is in fact not an organ per se, it's a chunk of your brain that sticks out into your nasal cavity. Cool, eh? And it works by detecting aroma molecules that strike it. But here's the kicker. The faster those molecules strike that nasal bulb, the more information they carry to your brain. That is, if you sniff harder and faster, you get more information about what the wine smells like. So you have to sniff hard. Let me demonstrate. Mm, nice cherry Merlot character. Now, that looks a little rude, and if you were raised at my mother's table, that'd get you a smack. But it's good winemaking etiquette. Go ahead and sniff deeply. It's important. And one more thing. After about two or three sniffs, your nose is going to reach what's called olfactory accommodation. It can't take in any more information about the wine that you're smelling. So you'll have to stop, get a little fresh air, and then you can go back to sniffing the wine. Mmm, nice. Finally, we get to the good part, tasting. Now in tasting wine, we don't just want to take a gulp and swallow it. We want to follow a set of steps which will allow us to get the maximum flavor out of that wine. The first step is to take a small sip. About a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon and a half of wine, and that's all. Don't swallow it. Hold it in your mouth, just behind your teeth, but in front of your tongue. With your mouth pursed, like you're going to whistle, you want to suck a little air in and pass it through the wine, across the back of your palate, and through your nose. Now, this is a little tricky to describe, much easier to show you. But what we're doing is we're drawing air through the wine for the same reason that we swirled it in the glass. We want to run some air through it to release those aromatic molecules where they will mix uh, in the back of our oral, oral cavity so that we can detect them. That'll drive the flavors and aromas and let us pick them out much more easily. After we've done that, we still don't swallow yet. Work the wine around the inside of your mouth. Your tongue has taste buds on it, but so does the roof of your mouth your cheeks, and part way down your throat. There aren't as many as on your tongue, but these can give you as much information as your tongue does. They'll tell you about the astringency, the heaviness, the alcohol content of the wine, and the sweetness. After you've worked it around your mouth, go ahead and swallow it and stop. 
Don't do another thing. Think about the wine as it changes and evolves on your tongue as it warms up and the alcohol evaporates and other compounds evolve. This can take two or three minutes. So you want to follow this process to see how the wine tastes over time. Now, I'll demonstrate that. Swirl, small sip. Hmm? Oh yeah, that's nice. Now, a word about professional tasting. When I'm tasting in my professional capacity, sometimes I have to taste up to 100 or 150 wines over the course of two days. I always spit in those circumstances. You have to. Even if I swallowed only a teaspoon of each wine, 150 teaspoon adds up to a lot and I'd need a nap before lunchtime. If you're just tasting your own wine and only maybe a couple, that's fine. You don't have to spit. That's all there is to it. It's pretty easy. You don't always have to apply this much intensity when you're tasting wines. But if you want to get your palate trained and into shape, I think it's important that you do it with every new wine that you taste. I'm famous for going into restaurants and doing this in front of friends and family, and they've kidded me about it for years. But it's been one of the most useful actions I've ever taken as a home winemaker. Go ahead, get out there and do your own tasting. And above all, enjoy your wine. I'm Tim Vandergrift, your technical winemaking advisor. Happy winemaking!